So let's talk about some radioactive isotopes. Well, what is an isotope to begin with? Well, an isotope is something that, you, well, you call something an isotope if it's got the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So we've got same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Same number of protons means it's the same element. Different number of neutrons means there's gonna be a different mass number. So here are some standard ones. Hydrogen one, that's just a proton. And that's standard hydrogen. Hydrogen two is called deuterium or heavy hydrogen. And this occurs in the ocean very rarely, but commonly enough that people say that there's enough deuterium in the ocean to supply our energy needs for millions of years if we're able to do fusion properly, which we're not yet, but we'll see. Then there's hydrogen three. So this is a proton and two neutrons. This guy is unstable, unlike these two that are both stable isotopes of hydrogen. This guy, which is called tritium, is very important in um, thermonuclear devices and in fusion studies. And he decays in about 12.32 years, that's the half-life, into helium-3, an electron, and an antineutrino. Now, most of the time, of course, if we're going to do this reaction, we'll want to put in the bottom numbers. And so we've got 3 equals 3 plus 0 plus, this guy's got to be 0. 1 equals 2 plus negative 1 plus, this guy's also got to be 0. So for that reason, I mean, it, didn't, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't have any charge, it doesn't have any mass. So it doesn't really interact in any of the nuclear reactions. And so most of the time, chemists won't even write that guy. But he is there, all right? So we've got electron, and this is called an electron antineutrino. All right, whatever. So these are some standard isotopes. We would say this is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, and these two are the stable isotopes of hydrogen. Some other important stable isotopes are lithium-6 and lithium-7. Both of these occur naturally in lithium, um, <clears throat> this one actually uh, made a big, big deal in the biggest thermonuclear device, biggest hydrogen bomb, that the United States ever set off. And this was in 1954. It's called the Castle Bravo explosion. It was supposed to be about 5 megatons, but instead it ended up being 15 megatons, mainly because lithium-6 was used to make a solid lithium deuteride um, fuel for the thermonuclear reaction, they didn't think that the lithium-6 was gonna participate in the reaction, but it actually did. Anyway, all right, so let's look at some standard radioactive isotopes. All right, uranium-238, that consists of the majority of uranium that's found on the Earth. It has a half-life of four and a half billion years and decays via alpha em emission. Uranium-235 is the big fissile. Fissile meaning I can use it in a nuclear reactor or in a nuclear bomb um, isotope of uranium. It's the one that we want. So if you say enriched uranium, it means that its uranium-235 content is much, much, much higher than that found in mined uranium. Now the reason, one of the reasons that uranium-235 is so rare in nature is that its half-life is only 700 million years, whereas the half-life of uranium-238 is four and a half billion years. So this is about the age of the Earth. Many half-lives of, of, of uranium-235 have gone by in the lifetime of the Earth, so that means that a lot of the uranium-235 that was present originally when the Earth formed is now gone. It's, um, it has decayed into thorium-231. All right. Thorium-232 is another very, very, very uh, commonly found radioactive isotope on the Earth. Uh, this consists of the majority of naturally occurring thorium on the Earth because the half-life of thorium-232 is about 14 billion years. He also decays via alpha emission. emission. Plutonium-239 is a very important isotope when looking at um, nuclear... Um, plants and when looking at nuclear uh, bombs. 
Uh, the, the reason that plutonium-239 is very, very, very important is that it's fissile. And that means that you can take a neutron, shoot it at this plutonium-239, and be almost certain that he'll fission and spit off some other neutrons and get going this chain reaction that we need to get going in a nuclear reactor. He alpha decays in 24,000 years. That means that he cannot be uh, naturally occurring. Too many half-lives have gone by since the beginning of the Earth for there to be any plutonium-239 left over, even if there was any when the Earth formed. So where do we get plutonium-239? Well, we get it by making uranium-238 undergo a nuclear reaction. We shoot neutrons at it that are slow moving. It will accept some of them, become uranium-239, and a couple of days later, that will have decayed into plutonium-239, and we'll have what we want. All right? What about radium-226? Radium-226 is a dangerous um, isotope. It appears in the uranium chain. So all this uranium that exists, that has this half-life of four and a half billion years, well, it's gonna decay at some point. And somewhere on that chain, you get radium-226. Radium-226 is the type of radium that was originally isolated by the Curies in the late 1800s. And uh, this guy has a half-life of about 1,600 years. So you can purify it from um, uranium ores. All right, then there's radon-222. This is the guy that you may have heard of if you've heard of radon poisoning in basements um, in the east. And it's because of the uranium that's present in the bricks that will decay. And eventually on the decay chain, we get this radon. Radon is a gas and that means that when we get this radon, it's just going to seep out of the bricks and you can breathe it in. You don't want to breathe it in though, because if you do, he alpha decays in about 3.8 days. And those alpha decays, while your skin will stop them, your organs kind of won't. All right, so if you breathe it in or if you eat an alpha emitter, not so safe no more. All right, so let's look at the more dangerous guys. Carbon-14 is a beta emitter. His half-life is about 5,700 years. Um, this guy actually occurs naturally in nature um, because of cosmic rays coming from the sun and their interactions with nitrogen and oxygen in the upper atmosphere. That will generate carbon-14 for us. Potassium-40, also a beta emitter, also is um, naturally occurring. His half-life is about one and a quarter billion years. Strontium-90 and iodine-131 are both byproducts of nuclear fission reactions. Um, so if you've got a nuclear bomb that goes off, you're going to have a lot of strontium-90 and iodine-131 in the air um, right after that nuclear reaction. Now, these guys are talked about a lot because they're beta emitters with appreciable half-lives and also because strontium and iodine will both be absorbed by the, the body and will be just held by the body. Strontium because it looks to the body like calcium and iodine because our bodies collect iodine in the backs of our brains. Um, now, ordinary calcium or ordinary iodine would be fine. I mean, okay, your body collects it for a reason. But strontium-90 is radioactive. His half-life is about 29 or 28.9 years. And that means that if our body, if you just take it in and the body says, ooh, this is good, let me use this to replace uh, calcium in the bones, that's not good. Because when he decays, just sitting there inside your bones, that beta is just an, uh, an electron moving very, very, very quickly. And he's going to go through and wreak havoc in your cells. Same thing with iodine 131, eight-day half-life, and so these things we want to avoid. And this is one of the big problems with nuclear fallout from uh, nuclear bombs. And then the last guy is polonium-210, which is an alpha emitter. Half-life is 138 days. And you may have heard of polonium-210 as the uh, radioactive isotope that killed um, the Russian spy. So those are radioactive isotopes.